One of the easiest places to spend a lot of money when building your next gaming PC is by splurging on a fancy motherboard. What sets apart a five or six hundred dollar motherboard design like this one from something more basic like this $120 ASRock board I picked up just a couple of weeks ago? So in today's video I'll be answering just that by taking two motherboards on the opposite end of the price spectrum to see whether or not an expensive motherboard is ever really required or whether you can save yourself a lot of money in your next system. Let's do this. Now let's begin, shall we, with a little bit of context. The whole idea of this video is not to say ASRock is the best and MSI is not the best, because the truth of the matter is all motherboard manufacturers make expensive and cheap motherboards, and of course, a few designs in the middle. And it's also worth noting that motherboard manufacturers like MSI, ASRock, Asus, Gigabyte, and more are reliant upon the chipsets designed by AMD and Intel for whom they manufacture motherboards. So let's start off, shall we, with an important bit of context about what sets all the different motherboards designs apart. Now of course the motherboard that you go for has a massive impact on the available selection of CPUs for your system. This particular MSI X670 board and in fact all X670E chipset motherboards come with the AM5 socket. That's AMD's socket for their latest Ryzen 7000 series of processors. Handily AMD have said this socket is going to last for a good few years so AMD's 8 and 9000 Ryzen lineups are set to work in a board like this one. And that's exactly the same with this ASRock A620 board. This uses the AMD A620 chipset, the bare bones chipset for AM5 CPUs, and comes with the same socket and same theoretical list of supported CPUs. That means if you really wanted to, you could take a top of the range Ryzen 7950X3D that's like five or six hundred dollars and put it in a board that costs five or six times less than the CPU itself. Not recommended, but totally plausible. CPU manufacturers develop a number of different chipsets for each of their architectures for really important important reasons. AMD have X670, B650 and A620, the X series being the most expensive, A series being the cheapest and B sitting somewhere in the middle. Intel do a very similar thing with their Z790 or Z690 boards at the top, the B760 or B660 boards in the middle and then their H chipset which go on and offer that little bit more value again. The whole idea with motherboard chipsets is to determine what sort of features brands are able to include on their motherboards. The X670E chipset has the most bandwidth and therefore affords the most number of available features. That means a high-end board like this has lots of X16 PCI lanes for multiple expansion cards, sound cards, multiple GPUs, networking cards, you name it, this board's got it. It also means you've got plenty of space for extra M.2 expansion, meaning you could pop in in some boards five, even more six or seven M.2 drives to all the various slots for maximum storage throughput and of course maximum speed. In fact, AMD's boards that end with the letter E also have PCI generation five support. That means you would theoretically be able to install future PCIe Gen 5 based GPUs when they eventually land, but that's not expected to be for a good couple of years yet at least. Of course, it goes without saying, the A620 chipset doesn't have that capability. So what capability does the A620 chipset have? And I suppose by extension, Intel's cheapest chipsets too. While high-end motherboards give overclocking support for CPU and memory, you'll be sacrificing this on low-end boards. You'll still have access to XMP or AMD's equivalent for choosing a higher RAM speed, but you won't be overclocking the CPU basically at all. AMD do let you overclock on their B650 chipset, so that's a winner for those of you on a budget, but naturally it will have less power delivery capability with fewer VRM phases, meaning that the potential overclocks on those boards is limited, even if it technically allows it to happen. Connectivity is also one of the biggest ones. You'll notice that the rear IOs between these two boards are very different. This board comes with 10 gigabit ethernet. You'll also find more USB-C of higher speeds, more front panel headers. This board's got two USB-C front panel cables and even has extra power delivery in the form of an auxiliary six pin next to the motherboard cable for, you guessed it, even more overclocking. By comparison, this ASRock board still has USB-C, but you'll only find one or two ports on the rear panel and a single port on the front panel. And while on this board, you might find two, three, or even four USB-3 headers, our ASRock Pro RS board only has the one. Boards like this X670E Ace also come with high-end wide 
Wi-Fi features as standard. On this board, the Wi-Fi version is an optional upgrade. It costs $25 or so, more than the cheaper board, and the Wi-Fi signal strength and speeds you'll get on a board like this are better. But as far as raw performance goes, is there a difference between these two boards? We're going to test that more in a moment, but first let's look at what we know. The A620 chipset is more power limited. As Hardware Unboxed detailed in a recent video where he looked at the A620 chipset, use a CPU with more than 65 watts of power consumption and you're going to be in trouble. That doesn't necessarily make this a bad board. In fact, I would disagree with anyone who says this is a bad board because what it does do is allows you to save money, which in a really budget build you can pour into other components. But it does make it a poor choice for those of you looking to go for something like an AMD Ryzen 7. And these things are all about balance. You'll also find on a higher end board like this more usability features. Toolless M.2 heat sinks mean you can, with a push of a button, take off the heat spreader, pop the drive in and slide everything back into place. Aesthetically, this looks way, way better than our ASRock A620 design. It doesn't make this a bad board, but naturally, gonna be a bit less pretty. The power delivery is perhaps the biggest one in this particular example. If you're gonna go for a high-end Ryzen 9 7950X 3D, a board like this is never going to be a good choice because the power delivery options simply aren't there. But this particular comparison is in many ways slightly flawed. When boards like this exist, the Asus X670E gaming Wi-Fi for more like 350 or 400 US dollars, and two, when boards like this Asus B650 design exist, for under a couple hundred. When you compare the highest and the lowest end components, you're naturally going to see a big chasm in performance. But that doesn't always carry over when you look at that middle of the market option. To try this out, we assembled two builds, one with this ROG Strix Gaming X670E Wi-Fi and one with this ASRock A620M Pro RS to evaluate the differences. So let's look at what we found. The first test that we did was Apex Legends at 1440p high. Both systems using a 7800 XTG GPU and a 7800X3D CPU, with otherwise identical specs, apart of course from the different motherboards. In Apex, the X670 board scored 257 FPS on average, while the A620 board was understandably lower at 253. You can see here there is a difference, but not one that's particularly discernible, and the frame rate differential between these really shows that the motherboard doesn't have that much of an impact on raw gaming performance. Hogwarts Legacy at 1440p high was a similar story. Yes, it's a simplifying the argument somewhat, but looking at the X670 versus the A620 board, there is a frame rate difference, but it's pretty tiny, just 4 FPS here. Warzone 2 at 1440p high is exactly the same, 155 on the X670 board and 153 on the A620 board. Now obviously, buying a high-end motherboard is about so much more than raw out-of-the-box performance. Whether it's the much better BIOS you get with an X670e board with better power delivery, better connectivity for multitasking and productivity-based workloads, more room for SSDs, better upgrade paths for high-speed memory in the future. There are so many advantages to spending more money on a board, but in terms of getting raw frame rate and raw gaming performance out the doors, that certainly isn't one. Pretty impressive if you ask me for a really, really cheap motherboard. So what then are the key takeaways from the tests we conducted? The first is that the motherboard within limits doesn't have a huge impact on performance, and you'll often find that spending an extra $200 on the motherboard, while will deliver you a little bit more frame rate, would be far more effectively spent in other areas, like a GPU upgrade. Something that's not going to increase your frame rate by 10%, but perhaps 20, 30, 40, or even 50%, depending on which cards you're jumping between. A good rule of thumb is that the lower end the CPU you go for, the cheaper the motherboard you can get away with. I would recommend running anything up to a Ryzen 5 7600 on this ASRock A620M design. The 7600X has good overclocking capability, making a B650 board a better bet. In fact, B650 is going to be totally fine for Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7 chips, and it's the same on the Intel side of the equation. Their B760 and B660 boards are totally fine for the i3, i5, and in some cases, but less advisable, the i7 processors. It's when you jump up to the higher end i7s and i9s and the higher end Ryzen 7s and Ryzen 9s that your more beefy boards come into the equation. Most people will want something like a ROG Strix X670E gaming Wi-Fi or an MSI Z790 Carbon. They're more measured motherboards for the kind of builds that you'll be assembling at these price points. Of course, if you want to go and get every single feature under the sun, something like an MSI X670E Ace is the natural choice. But this is only really useful for those of you doing content creation or things with super high intensity workloads where bandwidth and connectivity is of the utmost importance. For example, in the editing 
PCs in our office, we use super higher motherboards. Sometimes the boards cost more than the CPUs because we can cram in multiple gem for NVMEs, transfer huge amounts of data reliably, and connect to our high speed network with two and a half gig or more preferably 10 gigabit network ports. A $600 board might sound expensive, but factor in the extra costs you'd have to buy for a higher networking card and all the additional costs of trying to connect high power storage to a low power board and a low power build, and suddenly they start to seem that bit more reasonable. MSI aren't making the X670E Ace for people with a Ryzen 5 CPU. And while all of our testing of even AMD and Intel's lower end chips is done using high end boards to alleviate bottlenecks, it doesn't mean that you should go with a board like this and a cheaper CPU. But I also strongly believe that you should never discount a design like this ASRock A620M. It isn't perfect, far from it. But for those of you looking to save a lot of cash where you can pour that money valuably into key component upgrades like 32 gigs of RAM instead of 16, or an RX 6750 XT instead of a RTX 3060, it makes a lot of sense. I'll link all the boards mentioned and some of my favorite CPU choices down in the description below. Read our article on the best CPU and motherboard combos for an easy way to buy the right board. If you enjoyed this video, get subscribed. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.